Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, 2016. This is the week in charts. Once again, it's brought to you by me, my favorite person. <laughs> um, this is uh, obviously my trading service. If you want to get started for just 47, uh, for just 47 dollars, I'd love to have you aboard. Uh, we've been doing really well lately, uh, is, especially from an accuracy perspective. But as I often preach, I'd, I'd much rather make a lot more money and be a lot less accurate. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll get time to flesh that out later today. But we do have a lot to cover. There's a disclaimer screen. As I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously with this Brexit thing going on, I want to touch upon whether you should ignore news, trade it, or fade it. Uh, and the main thing I want to talk about today is why I teach trading. And then I do have an, an example what that we'll look at uh, in real time uh, on the, um, the actual Brexit thing. And then also on a, a discretionary call. Uh, and then obviously we'll look at current market conditions. Any questions you have on trading? And then, of course, your favorite stock picks. Now, when we get to the charts, uh, hold off on your stock picks for now so I can just see the questions. And we'll get to the charts. Just ask about one stock at a time. If you want to ask about 10 stocks, I'd love to talk about all 10. But just ask about one hit return and then ask about another. And I promise that we'll work hard to get to all of them. Now, let's talk a little bit about this this Brexit thing and news trading and so on and so forth. And I'm showing you this opening. I'm going to show you this opening gap reversal, which happened a couple days ago. And one thing I was thinking about as I was getting a glass of water before I got started is that keep in mind that if we are or if you are trading an opening gap reversal, you're it's just an SG type of trade. It's not it's not for. It's not your bread and butter. And number one, you got to be really careful if you are doing something like this to keep your losses really small. And you're not going to get rich doing it. And what I was thinking about as I was getting a glass of water is Linda Rasky was showing a trade once and she called it uh, a pizza party trade. You know, you make a little trade, you see, you kind of see that money laying in the corner, go over, pick it up. Uh, you're not going to get rich in this case, but it's just kind of a layup type of trade. Now, again, I don't really. I'm not a huge proponent of you going out and making these day trades, but these intraday position trades can be made. But more importantly, in much bigger picture, understanding the opening gap reversal concept can really factor into your other trading. Let's say you're in a position and it gaps above your initial profit target and you're all excited. Well, sometimes you can't look that gift horse in the mouth because many times – that initial excitement about the news comes, everybody rushes in, and then all of a sudden it fades quickly. And there's many reasons why it might do that. A big institution might use the, the liquidity to dump his position onto you or to whoever else. And there's, there's plenty of other reasons. Uh, all the excitement, everybody buys at once, and then there's no one left to buy. Left to buy. So a lot of times on these, these big, exciting pre-market events, there's a huge gap in the market, but that usually – fades or often fades I should say and just realize that markets overreact to news uh, quite often now again this this is not your bread and butter but sometimes you'll see a trade that looks like this and you can take it and again at the least even if you don't take these trades just know that they exist okay we're focused on the short to intermediate term uh, trading and hopefully to be in trades for a long, long time. And we're not in there just in and out all day. But occasionally, again, these intraday position trades do occur. So we obviously had, oh, well, they're not going to exit. Uh, Britain's not going to exit. In case, you know, I try to avoid as much news as possible. But in case you've been living under a rock, or even if you lived under a rock, you probably know a little bit about, you probably heard something about the Brexit which is uh, Britain separating from the EU. Uh, got a lot of emails from you guys across the pond over there. Phil, you in here, uh, Mark, uh, and some of the other guys. It seems like, I don't know if Phil's for it, but it seems like most of the guys that are emailing me are for it. But you got to realize that that's not a representative sample because these guys are 
capitalists and, and they're probably seeing longer term. I, I think it's probably a good thing longer term. But again, as like I said in a little uh, piece I wrote a few days ago, I'm not going to argue the point. Uh, and if you do want to argue it, uh, buy me a beer and a steak dinner and I'll be happy to uh, listen to your point. I might even not uh, argue back if you want. Anyway, a lot of excitement the other day. Market gaps up and open. It was way down here. Gaps way higher. This is the spiders. S&P futures could also be used or E-minis or whatever you want to use. Uh, the cash market doesn't work because you don't get a true open there. Anyway, so it gaps higher, and you can see that it initially trades higher, and then it begins to fade. Okay. So if you are playing a gap like this, you let that opening range get established, and then you short it when that opening range gets taken out. That's kind of like a la Toby Crable type of trading. He did a lot of opening, I think he called it ORBs, opening range breakouts. I call them ogres, opening gap reversals. Okay. R E V E R S A L. So you wait for that opening range to get established, and then you sell short. So as you can see, not all the time, but this is why you don't want to get too caught up in the news because you get that initial pop, and a lot of times that's it. Now, you could do a couple things. You could take partial profits along the way, and that's probably a good idea. You could trail a stop intraday, and then regardless of what you do, make sure you exit on, on close, okay? Mark's here checking in from Britain. Good. Yeah, you're outside of Britain, right? Just outside. So anyway, you don't want to hold overnight because you're not making much. You're just going to make whatever you can make intraday, and then a, another gap could show up tomorrow. So it will take a look at what's unfolding uh, today with this uh, latest uh, excitement there or whatever. But for the most part, I would encourage you to ignore the news I'm not saying, again, rush out and trade these opening gaps. I'm, I'm kind of beating a horse here. But just know how a market often reacts or overreacts to news. And by the way, it's not the news in and of itself. It's the reaction to the news. And one thing that uh, I often talk about is when Greg Morris gives a speech, or one of his speeches, I should say, he puts up a chart of um, – and I emailed him a while back. I think it's, I think it's AOL – for like uh, 10 or 15 years or so. And there were a couple of Gulf Wars, 9-11, uh, dozens of earning periods or whatever, or a dozen earning periods. I forget exactly how many. And he makes a lot of points. Like, uh, how could you pick out the these events? And maybe a few of the events might stand out a little bit. But the, the one point he was making is, can you pick out the earnings? And if you can pick out when the earnings were, can you tell me if they were good or bad? earnings and and so your life's gonna get a lot easier longer term if you ignore the news but there are a couple little things or a couple little tricks that are pretty they're pretty good to put into your quiver even if you're not going to actually trade them again maybe to get out of a trade that you might be in or maybe you might want to front run a trade let's say you come in and you've got a nice little pullback setup that looks something like this or let's say a TKO because that'd be a good example. You get a nice little TKO, looks like this, and then the market gaps lower, but then begins to reverse. Well, you might decide you might want to front run that trade, and that's a little bit more advanced uh, type of trading. And usually, you only want to do this type of front running in really good conditions. But again, knowing that propensity exists for that opening gap reversal can really help you out. It's kind of it's kind of funny. I'm sitting here teaching you how to trade opening gap reversals, and then I'm telling you to be careful with them and not making your bread and butter. So I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I think the main point that I'm trying to make is that you want to learn as much as you can about markets and then use those little tricks and tips to your advantage, especially in my particular case where we are trading for longer term gains, but sometimes that little opening pop might get us a little money out of the market on a position, let's say above the initial profit target uh, or on, on the downside, unfortunately, that open a gap reversal, we might have some bad news come out. We might be able to mitigate the losses on a position through damage control. So see the um, weekend charts, archives for a lot more on that. David Ryan, U.S. champion, invested winner, and former Bill O'Neill does not even look at the market for the first hour. He argues his decisions are amateur hour. Well, I completely disagree with Mr. Ryan. 
on that, Phil, because I've seen some really, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you might get triggered into a trade and within the first hour or so, you get all of your profits in that trade or majority of your move. Or if you wait an hour, you're going to miss the trade and you, you won't be able to take it. And one big winner might make all the difference in the world. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Maybe he has his reasoning, okay? Maybe he's he's running a fund. I just talked about Greg. Well, when Greg gets a stop on a stock, and back when he was running $6 billion, uh, he would wait a half an hour, okay? Well, that's okay because he's running billions of dollars, and I guess it would be an ETF in his case, and he would wait to see if it reversed, and if not, I guess he would begin scaling out of the position. Now, maybe Mr. Ryan is running billions of dollars, and he can't, he can't move that quickly, so he lets everything kind of shake out on the open. The problem is there are no exacts when it comes to trading. You can't say, oh, I'm not going to trade this particular time. Now, I'll give you a caveat where maybe you could do something like that. And, and again, it's not my style of trading, but I have a friend who has certain methods. And what he likes to do is he likes to avoid the first 30 minutes of trading. And then he's, he's implementing, implementing more of like a scalping type of strategy, not my cup of tea. Okay. But if you're trading trends, trends can exist or big price movements can exist in any month of the year. Some people are like, oh, don't don't trade the summer. Sell the man, go away. Well, sometimes sometimes that seems to work. But other times you might catch a really big trend in a stock over the summer. So you got to be really careful with those type of things. There are no hard and fast rules when it comes to trading, at least – not when it comes to when you should trade. So be careful with those type of things, okay? Does it work as well, long or short? The opening gaps, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it's long or short. I've only seen a blank chart. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Oh yeah, yeah, it's blank right now for dramatic effect. <laughs> OGR, Ogre sounds like a dorsal for Ogre strategy. It breaks up the opening range, either up or down. Uh, well, that's ORB. That's uh, ORB is, um, is uh, what's his name? Uh, Toby Crable type of thing, opening range breakout. And there are some systems based on that. Uh, I'm not a proponent of those systems. I'm not selling them. But it does help to learn about these type of things. It can factor into your trade, okay? He actually waits for the range to post, okay? Okay. Now, let's get into the main subject this week, why I teach trading. Well, one reason I teach is for ego purposes. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to go all freshman psychology on you. I'm not too much freshman psychology. But there is this Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And... I find the teaching sort of fulfills those needs up here. The achievement mastery, the recognition and respect. And I, I like the way that they, the, the way they worded this on this uh, particular chart. I don't know exactly where it came from. Pursue inner talent and creative fulfillment. So I am getting a lot of those things from teaching. Okay. And then obviously there's a there's a big ego involved. Uh, I'm a ham. I enjoy being up on stage. I enjoy being in front of you. A friend of mine used to call me Mr. Information. <laughs> and I I try not to be the Clive Clavin guy. But I guess in some cases I, I can be a little bit like that. I, I tend to absorb knowledge. I love learning things, especially new things. And I think that's probably what attracted me to the markets, or certainly was what kept me there. I initially, it looked pretty easy on the surface, um, and then I realized how difficult it is and how it's a constant challenge. Uh, this, it's a funny. The guy who called me Mr. Information, he once bought me a shirt that said Mr. Information and a hat that said Ask Me as a joke. And this was before the Internet, 
or Google, certainly. Yeah, before the internet, I guess. And he made fun of me, but he would always call me and ask me questions. And it's, it's, he's the same guy that turned the 5,000 into a million. Unfortunately, he round tripped it. Round tripped it. He round tripped it. And uh, it ended badly, uh, not just in his account, but for him, too. And we've talked about this a few times. Maybe buy me a couple beers and we'll, we'll I'll flesh out some other details of the story that are quite interesting that I can't put into writing. But anyway, it was kind of funny. On his first trade, he called me up uh, and said, um, he called like a local broker and that's back before the online brokers were pretty big. And, uh, Hey Dave, the broker wants to know, I want the stock to go up. So the broker wants to know if I should be buying a call or buying a put. And so I was like, you want to buy, you want to buy a call. And then I hang up the phone the phone rings a few minutes later. Hey Dave, the broker doesn't know whether he's supposed to close or open the position. It's like, you're going to open, you're going to buy to open your calls. So anyway, that's kind of like a, uh, I digress a little bit, but it's kind of funny. But the guy who called me Mr. Information. Now, the other thing about teaching is seeing the world and meeting great people. And again, here comes my ego uh, coming out. Doesn't hurt either. Okay, I've been on quite a few of the continents, not quite all of them just yet. But I've been on a few and it's been kind of a, it's been kind of an exciting trip and exciting journey. I've met some great people along the way. I know most of the old timers in the business. I don't know a lot of the new guys that are coming up, but if they're around for a while, I'm sure I'll get to know them. So I really enjoyed helping others and make no bones about that. I, I help a lot of people and I don't make a dime from it. And, and it's just, there's, it is rewarding. And I am filling those Maslow's hierarchy of needs, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not completely altruistic. I teach, quite frankly, because I make money teaching. Although I enjoy it a lot, I actually make money doing it. So there, in case you're wondering. Because people like often think, well, if you got this golden goose, why would you sell it? And the answer is, I don't know. I, I wonder the same thing myself. And as I said last week, someone a while back had a webinar where they, if you gave them I think it was a thousand dollars, but you had to act right away. They would show you how to turn five thousand into five hundred thousand. Well, that if that does happen, it's an aberration. You're taking ridiculous risk. It's not repeatable. You're likely to blow up, as my friend did. Okay, and then you're likely to have some pretty bad psychological issues after you blow up. So you can't turn 5,000 into a half a million. And even if, even if they did, they can't repeat it. And more than likely you won't be able to repeat that either. So like in life, again, as I often preach, this is one of my favorite graphics. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Okay. So you probably think, well, big Dave, what are you selling? Well, I'm selling reality, common sense, and the only way to make money in a market. And it's a little bit hard work, but it's fun. So let's break that down. And trust me, if I was selling a turn 5,000 into a half a million, I'd probably make a lot more money. Although I do know this, there's an old Southern saying, you could shear a sheep a thousand times, but you can only skin that bastard once. And I think that these guys are beginning to, uh, they're beginning to get fleshed out. I think a little sunlight's being shined on the um, on the situation. That's that's the best disinfectant there is. Anyway, let's break it down. So I am selling reality, and the reality is the only way to profit from a trade, any trade, is to capture a trend. I hear a lot about certain type of systems, and I don't want to pick on anyone because I could think of a recent example, and I, and I almost – almost like ripped him a new one, but I'd stop short. But the only way to make money in a market is to sell higher than you buy. And the only way to make money in the market is to capture a trend. And I think a lot of people lose sight about, about that fact. And it sounds like a Captain Obvious sort of statement, you know, duh. But if you ever catch yourself plotting that 15th oscillator, you need to ask yourself, is the market going higher or lower? And is there a place where 
I can get on. I'm also selling a pure form of technical analysis. I'm not selling some sort of arcane method. And then when you try to apply it, I tell you why it didn't work in hindsight, because you did it wrong, because you missed your, I hate to use the word wave count or whatever, but for lack of a better <laughs> analogy, your wave count or whatever. So in pure technical analysis, never forget that if a market is going from, from A to C, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. So, again, I'm selling the fact that you have to buy. I'm sorry, you have to sell higher than you buy or short higher than you cover. Sell higher than you buy, okay? And, by the way, from A to B is a trend, okay? And that... If a market is going from A to C, it has to pass through B. That's a, that's a fact. That is a fact. That is the only true fact when it comes to markets. Well, can you just buy at B? Well, in some cases you can. Uh, I think if all you did was buy new highs, provided you bought enough of them, I think you would do okay longer term and provided that you had caught some decent conditions longer term. Uh, I have a, an IPO strategy, which I actually call buy at B, which is something very similar to doing that. So I'm selling the fact that technical analysis works, but I'm selling a pure form of technical analysis and not some sort of mumbo jumbo where you're just reading the emotions of the market participants. And obviously you have to control your own in the process. Now, never forget, there's only three states in which a market can exist. The man supply and equilibrium so there are my three arrows that i'm often selling is it an uptrend is it a downtrend or is it going sideways if it's an uptrend then you need to be doing what buying stocks if it's a downtrend then you need to be selling stocks or impossibly selling short stocks okay at the least you need to be unloading the stocks in your portfolio of course if and only if the stop is being hit and then obviously, if you're going sideways, you need to be super duper selective. If the overall market's going sideways and if the individual stock is going sideways, then you need to avoid it altogether. So this is what I'm selling. I'm selling basic technical analysis, and that's what I actually use in my own trading. I'm not selling a magic bullet. I'm selling reality. And I probably would make, again, a lot more money if I was selling the, a, a quote unquote magic bullock. I'm, I'm making little air quotes in the air. Don't you hate people to do that? So you need to always ask yourself, is the market going up, down, or sideways? Is there demand? Is there supply? Is there equilibrium? And it might not be doing what you want, but unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. So what am I selling? Identifying existing or emerging trends. Emerging trends, bow ties, first thrust, patterns like that. A little bit more advanced patterns, such as like a, a gatekeeper. But for the most part, usually something as simple as a first thrust, a big thrust from highs, big thrust from lows, and you're looking to get in at the first little correction. Or a bow tie, we have all the moving averages cross over. See my website if you're new to these presentations for a lot more on that. And also see all the other YouTube. So once you identify that trend, then you're looking for a place to get on. And then you must have a money in position management plan. So I'm selling a money in position management plan to stay with them when they are right and mitigate the losses when you're wrong. And obviously the proper mindset to plan the trade and trade the plan. I guess other than the books, I really haven't sold, quote unquote, for any for any monetary gain, uh, anything on psychology, not that I, I won't ever, because I am working on some things on that. One thing that I have learned through teaching is that I learn a lot through teaching. And this is kind of a, a grandiose example, but literally and figuratively, I guess. But when I start getting, start to, stand in front of these big screens and I'm seeing price bars that are like three and four feet, I began seeing some things that I might not have ever seen on my little 20-something inch monitors. 
So sometimes you see a move like this, which is six feet tall. So for reference, I'm six feet tall, six feet two, actually. I'm pretty wide too. <laughs> so, but that's another story. I'm working on that. I'm work. I've been working on that for a long time, but I'm working on that. I begin to see things. One example of uh, what I've seen on the big screen, which I didn't really notice as much on the little screen, is like short-term persistency. Short-term persistency means that a market tends to go up day after day after day. And I'll just show you that real quick. I have a pattern called persistent pullbacks, which should be on my website. If not, it's in some of the YouTube. So persistency is a market goes up day after day after day. With a persistent pullback, I like to see about 20 days and then some sort of pullback or knockout move. But one thing I notice in looking at those big screens, even like a short term, a very short term move, persistent move, and especially in something like an emerging trend, like right around the time you get a bow tie or a first thrust, if you get a little persistent move out. And, and I learned that simply by all of a sudden it hits me like a ton of bricks, like getting hit, hit in the head with a halibut when I see that on a huge screen. So that's one thing that I have learned through teaching. Now, another reason I teach is because it makes me work a lot harder. Sometimes I have a shitty day, and you know what I want to go do? I want to go drink beer. That's what I want to go do, okay? I don't want to sit here for the next two or three hours looking at charts, even though I love looking at charts. But if I had a bad day and it puts me in a bad mood, I'm not going to be inclined to do my homework Unless, and of course, there's somebody depending on me. So I feel like I must leave no stone unturned. I have to do the work. Now, what's kind of interesting in, in, in being forced to do the work, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, I'm like, well, wait a minute, Dave. It really wasn't that bad today. And then maybe in some cases actually scratched out or actually – maybe made a little bit of money. Not that you want to focus too much on the day-to-day, -day, but come on, we all have a, pu a pulse. It affects us, okay? It, you can't say that it doesn't. And I know I'm kind of even-keeled and laid back. And, hey, guys, look what happened today. Uh, okay, let's take a look at this position. And I'm calm. And, you know, some people are like, how can you be so calm about it? Well, you know, I dropped my F-bombs earlier in the day, and then I chilled out a little bit, looked at my charts, and then I realized, hey, maybe it wasn't that bad, Okay. So even though the, the situation may be crappy, I feel like I must leave no stone unturned and exhaust all possibilities. I've told the story quite a few times recently, and I'll probably write about it in, in the blog tomorrow. But earlier this year, the market was choppy back in February, kind of all over the place. Not that it's gotten any better yet or since. And somebody said, Dave, I'm going to take a break from this. Everybody's like, okay, well, why are you taking a break? It's like, well... I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future. And I'm like, this guy's right. I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future either. But that same night, a couple hours after I got the email, I found two stocks. Okay. One turned out to be the biggest winner, I think, so far this year. And the other one turned out to be a mediocre winner, stopped out at a profit, made a profit, stopped out at a profit. Better than poke in the eye. I'll take that any day of the week. And as I often say, if somebody complains about making a profit, on a trade that I recommended, just send me the money. And go center yourself, you know, have a, get yourself, a, a, get, save a little money for a massage, but then send me the money and forget about that trade. Anyway, it makes me, it makes me leave no stone unturned, exhausting all possibilities. I, I have like a, uh, I guess it's, it's almost like a guilt. It's like, did I really look at every sector? Did I really look at all these stocks that I, did I, Make sure there's nothing that I missed, and then I have to weigh my findings against doing nothing. So being, I'm being forced to do this homework every day, and, and I guess, quite frankly, I'm being paid for it too. So that's kind of cool in the process. Now, but I'm not telling you because I'm, I'm getting paid. I'm telling you because what I've learned and what I do, so could you to become a better trader. It also forces me to practice what I preach. So if ever I find myself trying to fight trends, trying to outsmart the market, or getting really pissed off, what do I always preach? What is, is. I just said that a few minutes ago. So it forces me 
to look at the markets and realize what is is and it also forces me to honor my stops a couple of days ago I'm in a position and I didn't have a hard stop in place you know shame on me but I was hanging out here doing some work and I figured I didn't need one I just kind of keep an eye on the screen and this stock began to get away from me or well, you're probably saying Dave what's the stock well you don't need to know unless you're on the service. <laughs> and one reason I felt like I had to honor my stop was because this stock is setting up as a new position. It, it looks pretty good, but I can't let it keep dropping against me. So it forced me to exit the position. It's like I exit the position, no questions asked, and then, then I was free again, okay? So it forces me to do the right thing. Uh, another example, a while back, I had a bunch of positions on, and this was uh, when I was doing some uh, a lot of Forex trading. I, I had a little – I still trade Forex, but I, I got hot and heavy into it for a while. And I was doing really, really, really well for a while. And I just happened to – I'm not bragging. I happened to catch conditions just right. And my wife walked into the office to say hello or goodbye, more, um, more likely goodbye. She was on her way somewhere or whatever. And I'm like, hey, babe, check this out. I got these all these positions that are doing really well. And then I said, I'm not really sure what I should do. And you know what she said? She said, what would Dave Landry do? And she turned around and walked out of my office. So I sat there stunned for a minute. I'm like, oh, you're right. What would Dave Landry do? Well, he would take partial profits and he would trail the stop higher. So it forces me to do the right thing. Now, Again, my ego is kind of rearing its ugly head today. I don't know that. And I understand that. So let's bring it back to you. How does this relate to you? If you made it this far, I didn't kind of run you off by now. Well, first of all, if you're learning or if you're in sync with what I'm doing, that's great. Find a guy who talks as much about you, the trading psychology part that is, and money management as he does about the methodology. And obviously – my ego rear its ugly head. I think that's me. And if it's someone else, make sure he does that, he or she, and then also make sure the methods are grounded in reality, conceptually correct. All these things I already talked about a few minutes ago. And make sense, and it, well, I left out some words here. It makes sense to you, and it's something that, and makes sense to you, something that you could actually follow. OK, the greatest methodology in the world is useless if it doesn't make sense to you and you can't follow it. So continuing on how this relates to you, it's like I feel like I'm kind of forced to get better because I'm, I'm under a bit of a microscope. And I would encourage you through deliberate practice, meaning that don't just look at your charts. When you're looking through your charts, look to get better. And if you do a little studying on deliberate practice, it's it's kind of a fascinating subject. I would, I'm trying to think if I have some books here I could recommend to you. All my books are kind of a mess. I had them in a big pile on the floor, and um, Greg Morris was visiting my wife put them all back in the bookshelf. So now I'm completely lost as to what I was reading, rereading and need to read, but just Google deliberate practice and ask me some questions. If you, if you, um, if you stumble across some books and I'll let you know if it's, if I'd recommend it or not, but deliberate practice is just not just practicing. It's working to get better. So when you're looking at your, uh, I, I, by the way, I'm reading a book called eight to be great. Uh, just, a, it's a little book on, a guy who interviewed a lot of, um, I, I saw it in a TED talk, interviewed a lot of successful people. And, and they're talking about, I just got through the chapter where they talked about practice, which is kind of reaffirming. So deliberate practice means you see a stock that took off. You may not have, you may not have caught that position, but you need to look at the chart and say, could I have caught that position? Honestly, ask yourself. Is there a pattern that I trade or is there a pattern I could learn from this chart when you're looking through your charts every night? Now, in a lot of cases, maybe not, okay? 
but you need to do that deliberate practice so you constantly get better and better at what you do. Like somebody said in here a while back, and I think it's also in the book I just mentioned, um, it was one of the jazz greats or, or, or forget who it was, but they said that if I don't practice for a day, I, I can hear it. And if I don't practice for two days, my audience knows it. So you got to work for that deliberate practice to strive to get constantly better, even though it's just you against yourself. And then you need to hold yourself accountable, even if no one is watching. And that self-introspection can be kind of tough. I do like the way that uh, I think it was, and I get all these books confused because they all kind of say the same things. I started reading a bunch of behavioral science books, uh, behavioral finance books, and and they all kind of they all kind of blur one into the other. So I'm probably not the greatest at, at giving the the credit where credit is due. But in one of them, they pointed out that the men who got their spouses involved in their trading, their trading actually got better. And that's because the spouses probably asked the hard questions, which you guys out there who married, <laughs> you probably know that. And it, it before I get too far lost here. But the flip side was that the spout, the women who got their husbands involved in the trading, the trading actually got worse. And the reason is because, at least what I believe, is because the ego, I think the ego trumps emotions as far as problems with trading. Uh, who was it? The hedge fund guy. I forget who he is. I could, I'm trying to think it. Uh, was it, um, what was his name? Anyway, he said that women women are bad traders because they're too emotional. And, 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 but I think emotions are okay. It's the ego that's, that's bad. Now, your wife could ask a lot of questions. Uh, I don't know if I said it or not, but the, the women who had the men involved, their, their trading got worse. So you women out there, don't let your husbands get involved with your trading, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But for you men, as painful as it might be, it might be a good thing. A lot of times I'm working on something around the house and my wife starts peppering me with questions. And I'm like rolling my eyes, like leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. And then every now and then she'll ask a question and I'll think, I never thought about it like that. And she teaches me by asking me something I never thought about doing and make my life a lot easier. So I'm doing a honeydew project or something. So... And the other thing, too, is you want to shed some light on what you're doing, teach it to someone. I have I forget how many emails it was. I think back when I did layman's, it was 30,000 emails. It might be more than that. That seems like a small number. But I've answered thousands and thousands of emails to a point now where I'm finally thinking I've got to turn all this into a, to a fact. I frequently ask questions because – uh, what if I die? What if I get hit by a beer truck? You know, <laughs> I've got all this knowledge that's out there. And the other thing I've done lately, not to digress too far, imagine that he digress, is that in a service, if somebody asks me a question, so just one person doesn't benefit, gets a benefit, I post it so everyone in the service could see the answer to the question. And so far, that's been very beneficial. I'm kind of excited about that. I know it's kind of a simple little thing to do. But it's helped out tremendously. But anyway, being peppered with these questions for years and years and years and years has forced me to cement my methodology. So I would encourage you to get somebody else involved with you and explain what you're doing. So that's how it relates to you. Now, I know I've kind of talked about the ego and the money and the other things and, and the selfish reasons, uh, selfish reasons in that I learn from what I'm doing. But you could do the same thing by getting somebody involved. All right. Lots of questions coming in. I promise I'm, I'm done pontificating. <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, right now, the Mark says EU is acting like they're going to stay. <laughs> Wi-Fi at the bottom. Yeah, that's funny. I will pay you to turn 5K into only 50K. Well, if you're willing to give me the 5K... Um, and you're willing to lose it all? We could certainly, we could certainly give it a shot. 
You know, we'll, we'll over leverage. We won't use stops. We'll do all kind of crazy things. And we're either going to end up with um, zero or nothing. Zero or something, maybe. 14 slip. Gap from A to C skips B completely. All right. Uh, you know, it's kind of like <laughs> we were <laughs> – that reminds me of a – so so Howard said if it gaps from A to uh, C, it skips B completely. Okay. Um, well, maybe we need to talk about that being longer term. It's funny. I was on the uh, – we were going somewhere in the car the other day, and my 22-year-old was in the back seat. And I said something. And um, and she said she she said something, and I I kind of snipped back a little uh, snide comment back or something, and she said she said touche, but what I heard was douche, <laughs> like like um like that's a that's a nasty comment, but. It's touche, but douche. So, yeah, I mean, um, that's a good point. You know, you got me on that one. Uh, but here's the thing. Longer term, okay, and even if it does gap around, it's still, it's still sort of pass through B, okay? Maybe you don't get in at B if it gaps through it, but maybe on a pullback into the gap you get into it or something, okay? And then much, much longer term, the gap is going to be irrelevant. So that's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up. See what I'm saying about uh, asking the hard questions? Oh, Angela. Angela's just kidding on the 5K to the 50K. I was, looking, I was looking forward to getting 5K in the mail and uh, and see what we could do. I'll do I'll, we'll be completely transparent. <laughs> you lost me on the Coors handbag. Uh, I'm, I must be out of context. The question is, what do we get out of this? The answer is direction and mostly all good trading stuff. Thanks. Okay, good. Trading is a solitary activity, but beer is a social activity. They complement each other. Howard. All right. Sounds good to me. Working on getting wider. You lost me on that one, Phil. Oh, yeah, me working on getting wider. <laughs> six by six. <laughs> now I'm doing a few things. I'm actually working out a little bit. I'm doing, I'm spinning right now. I know it sounds gay, but not that there's anything wrong with being gay or spinning. When I'm kind of a manly man. No way trading with spouse is good. Well, yeah, if it's going to ruin your marriage, don't do it. Um, and, and, and be prepared for some really hard questions. Okay. Craig says, I know an Olympic level woman equestrian. And her motto is practice. Does that make perfect? Perfect practice makes perfect. I've heard that before. Perfect practice makes perfect. We will never get there as traders, but that is a level of effort required. Yeah, and you know, it's it's an imperfect world, this trading thing. And right when I whenever I start feeling really good about myself and how great I am. It's usually right around the time I get my ass handed to me, usually the next day or maybe that night or overnight. So it's a very humbling thing, and sometimes it's hard, and I was thinking about this recently, actually just yesterday. Sometimes it's hard to chip away, chip away, chip away, lose, 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 and all of a sudden, bam, you get that one trade that makes it all back and then some. You know, like uh, Sakota song saying in the Whipsaw song, uh, one big, one big, um, one big loser pays. One big winner pays for them all. Um, I forget how he said it, but he also went on to say, "What do you do with a news flash? You take the news flash and throw it in the trash." So um, do a YouTube on the Whipsaw song when you get a chance. I have it liked on my YouTube channel, so you can find it there. Okay. Um, Jill says, definitely like the new fact section. You're welcome, Jill. Yeah, a lot of people getting benefit out that. You know, I realized that a while back. I'm just giving all these answers to one person individually, and it's great. I'm, I, I enjoy connecting and, and helping out one person, but if I could help out everyone, life gets a lot easier. So, and all this content is being uh, wasted, okay? 
So Angelo knew what I was talking about. Well, good. You're welcome, Angelo. Uh, he figured out what the stock is talking about. He's on the service, so he knows. How do I practice daily a strategy that as results unfold over a period of months and years? What what us my point of reference? What is your point of reference? Well, Shay, what you're doing is what I'm saying that you do is you look at charts and you say, okay, um, I mean, this is kind of a, you say, okay, like take a look at CNX. That's the big winner we have in the portfolio right now. If I can get it to come up. You look at a chart like this, and it's not the best setup in the world. But you see a stock like this it's, that's, that's taken off from the lows, okay? And again, it's not the best example in the world, but you see this thing and it's like, okay, this stock has ran, peaked the trough, has ran up 209%. Okay, so let's say you're, let's say you're doing your analysis and you're on, you're like somewhere in here. Let me see if I could get the scaling right so it looks decent. And you see this stock, it's like, okay, that's the stock that's obviously take it off. Is there something or was there something there? that I could actually trade it. And it's like, well, yeah, there's a there's a bow tie off of all-time lows, okay, that would have got you into this trend. And as far as I'm concerned, it looks like this thing is just beginning to just beginning to take off. I mean it it I think I think this stock could easily be a triple, okay? Could easily go up to 30 bucks a share before it starts hitting any problems. Will it do that? I don't know. Probably not, but at least it has the potential. So when you're looking at those charts and you see something that's headed higher or has been headed higher, you need to ask yourself, was there a pattern there I could have traded? Okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other recent examples. I mean, this one didn't work out greatly, but uh, let's see if I can find it. Let's say you see, you see a little IPO that just kind of took off out of a pullback. It's like, well, could you have seen this pullback? And the answer should be, yeah, you should have been able to see that. Let's see. If I can make this do right. Let's see if it looks better this way. A little more obvious. Okay. Yeah, it looks a little bit easier like that. Okay. So say you're, you come in on, on this particular day here and you see the stock that made new highs that took off. It's like, well, was there a pattern that it could have traded there? Okay. Ask yourself that. And if there isn't and you don't see anything, then, then kind of make a mental note of that. And maybe there is something that you're not seeing. And then, so tomorrow, the next day, a month from now, two months from now, you see another stock like this take off out of a little pullback. You're like, ah, those pullbacks are a pretty good thing. Maybe I should be trading those pullbacks, okay? So that's what I mean by deliberate practice, is you want to keep looking at those charts and ask yourself, was there a pattern that I could have seen? Is there something tradable? I don't know if I have any announcements. Let me just see if I have any announcements in here before I uh, we get to the charts. Um, I think the website is, is getting close to being done. I'm putting a lot of content on the back end. So if you start digging on the back end, in other words, you, where I have like 500 posts, uh, you'll see that there's more and more posts being added to the back end. A lot of lost content out there. It's like lately, last few months, I've been in this kind of journey on uh, reclaiming content or not losing any content that I'm creating. So a lot of those old weekly charts I'm putting up or YouTube and the website. So check that out. Feedback is always welcome. Let me know if there's something you want to see or something I'm doing wrong or whatever. Uh, please don't tell me you want to program the website. I've got plenty of uh, <laughs> plenty of people that want to do that. It's kind of like uh, the sit at home and make money schemes and everything else. So, again, I'm rolling out a lot of the old content. All right, let's get to the charts here. And let's take a look at what's happening so far today. Now today, and this is why you gotta let's see if we can get a better chart here. Here we go. 
Now, you can see here's an opening gap reversal, but it didn't reverse that much. So a couple things. You might, when you see an opening gap reversal like this, you might give it some time to let that range get established, okay? And if it keeps dropping, then you got to make a go or no-go decision if you want to trade that gap. The other thing you could do is once – once that range is established, then you could say, well, I'm only going to short if it goes below a certain level. Again, this is just, like I said earlier, like Linda calls it the pizza party trade. You're not, trade, you're not going to get rich. Even if you did take it, I don't know if you would have gotten much out of it, but you certainly wouldn't have lost much going after it. So it's just an S&G type of trade, and this is not your bread and butter on these situations. But the point is, don't get too caught up in the news, and if anything, fade the news. And like I said um, – in the recent column, if, if there is a news event with a stock, let's say it's bad news and the stock goes down, we'll buy the stock when the stock crosses back up above that bad news day, okay? Now, I'm not saying that's just what your strategy should be in and of itself, but just know that there's an edge there to help you in your trading, okay? So it's safe to say you actually back test the strategy. What about the market conditions? I forward tested the strategy after I back tested it. So back tested and forward tested, okay? But be careful in the back testing because the map is not the territory. There are little subtle changes that can happen in the market. Um, if you do back test something, remember that you must use a survival database, okay? Back test it in, a, in, a, in your regular database, but just remember that there might be some bad things that happen that you're not gonna see. For instance, if you're testing a methodology, it, it uh, you don't have Enron in your survival database, then you're certainly gonna, you're not gonna see that that possible bad trade that could have happened with Enron, okay? Forward testing is you're just doing your homework every day and seeing what happens, and that's where the deliberate practice comes in, getting better and better. But, yeah, look at as many charts as you can. I was in a webinar yesterday, and I was asked, I was on a panel, and I was asked, what do you do to keep yourself busy when there's nothing to do in the markets? Well, that's when you, that's when you want to go in – and you want to look at some charts historically and play around with the charts. I keep myself incredibly busy because otherwise I will be firing off day trades. I know myself, okay? One of the traders and market wizards, um, they said he didn't have a quote machine on his desk or whatever. Forget the whole story. But he said having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine on your desk, you know? And you're going to want to feed that. So find something to keep you busy. Go in and look at markets historically. I mean, if I ever do find myself get bored, which is rarely, it's, it's I don't get bored. I just don't feel like doing the work I have to do. But I will do things. I'll just go back and look at simple things like moving averages and simple little systems, and I'll hand test them. I no longer program trading systems. I actually go in and hand test. Them. So go in and hand test bow ties. Go in and hand test longer term moving averages. Go in and hand test daylight. Okay, things that are going to help you capture trends. Go in and, and hand test bow ties, okay? And then work a little money management into your testing to where you're not just looking at the buy, the sells, but also some, some scaling out along the way to help keep you in the trend if it, if it continues and at least make something if it doesn't, okay? What is S&G? Stop and go. Anybody from England in here want to let us know what S&Gs are? That's, that's because I have some uh, British friends. S&Gs is simply shits and giggles, just for fun, okay? Hi, Dave. We're mostly out of the market. Hi, Dave. When we're mostly out of the market, what do we do to park our money? Cash is a net loss over time. Money market ETF, low risk bond ETF, something we could sell as fast, get back into stocks. Well, Eric... There's no, uh, there's no really good answer for that because there's no, I don't believe there's any good longer term investments. Okay. 
And we're talking nickels and dimes now that we're down here at this low, low percentage rate, okay? Um, when rates are higher, then obviously you could worry about these kind of things. Um, but as long as it's safe and secure, you know, I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, I'm not a, a fixed income kind of guy, so maybe maybe study that. How can you totally ignore binary news events like the stupid Brexit thing? Well, what do you do? You plan your trade, you trade your plan. You can't, you can't change your whole life, okay? Now, what did I say earlier? You exhaust all possibilities and then weigh that against doing nothing. The IP we've got we've got a couple little IPOs and they'll probably come off the radar today just because um, I don't know if they're worth it or not anymore. I mean they, they might they're no longer set up or whatever. But I don't think the Brex is going to make a big deal with the IPOs. We've got a couple open positions, so what? Just put a stop in place. If you're if you've made the transition to longer term trend following, then your stop should be wide enough to. Avoid this news type of event, and if it takes you out, then it takes you out. Okay. Now, will I cuss and fuss when it happens? Probably, but longer term, you have to learn to ignore the news because it's only going to make your life worse trying to factor in the news, and it's impossible to factor in the news unless you're. You're, you're possibly fading the news with the strategy, which, again, I don't fully recommend you do that, but know that the strategies exist. Downtrend base, higher highs, higher lows equals possible new advanced stage. Downtrend base, higher lows, higher highs. I'm not sure what you're saying, but higher highs and higher lows, yes, equals an uptrend. And as far if you talk about the overall market, in fact, let's let's go through the market real quick, and then we'll. Uh, you guys want to start asking about individual stocks? Ah, you jumped the gun on me, huh? You can start asking now. Um, let's take a look at the P's first. So you say it's making higher highs and higher lows, meh, maybe a little bit, but you still have some overhead supply to overcome. Stop me if you heard that before, okay? So people that are getting excited, people that call it new bull markets, like, well, why not wait until the market's up here until you think that the market is going to continue higher, okay? And if the market is doing that great, then it should at least be able to get past these old prior highs in here. Um, as been saying, a nausea, wide and loose and sideways, longer term so far in this market. I mean, where do you want to go back to? 2014, okay, we're up 1.69%. And 1% of that is today. So two days ago, we'd actually be down since December of 2014 in the peaks. I think a market, if a market's headed higher, I mean, sands a little consolidation in the base here and there, but it needs to be making forward progress. So this should be concerning in the fact that it hasn't made forward progress in a long, long time. Ditto for the NASDAQ, even more so than the NASDAQ. Look at the overhead supply here, okay? That we're dealing with. Now, let me interview myself. Have does this mean we're not buying stocks? No, we've bought stocks in here, and they've been in quite a few positions over the last couple of years. Okay, in spite of the market going mostly sideways. Now, when it was selling off, we were shorting back here. By the way, we were shorting back here. So if you look at the trades from earlier this year, they were mostly shorts. And then we started going long. Why? Well, the market was going up, and not so much that the market was going up, and it, although it helped, but because we started seeing setups. Okay. So it's kind of like I know it's a little cliche, but in more recent times, it's been much more of a a market of stocks versus a stock market. 1999, when the market's just going straight up, it's a, it's a stock market. Okay. Let's throw a dart. Uh, quite a few times since 2009, since the market bottomed out, it's been throw a dart, okay? 
But in more recent times, you have to be super duper selective and weigh that against the chart uh, of, of not doing anything. Somebody pointed out, uh, was, was, was sent me their results for the year, and uh, they were pointing out in the service that we really haven't been that committed as far as the account. The full account has not really been committed that much. So it's like if you were to look at the returns, they're okay. But if you look at the amount of capital that was committed, that it makes a much bigger difference. So on that, and for educational purposes only, obviously, hypothetical 100K account, maybe we're only using 30, 40K at a time, if that much, okay? Now, looking at the Russell 2000, again, as I've been preaching ad nauseum, it's gone sideways since 2013, and it's all over the place, okay? Don't get me wrong. It looks like an electrocardiogram. But on a net-net basis, and never forget about the net-net basis, it's gone sideways since when? 2013. So that's one thing to look at. Um, the sector, actually, a lot of sectors have looked uh, questionable, kind of all over the place, but questionable at best. There's the transports. They've been in a pretty serious downtrend. Uh, some of the areas that have improved are just getting back to their prior recent highs in here. And like the overall market, they still have some overhead supply to deal with. So it's hard for me to get excited about stocks in general. A lot of areas like drugs just kind of chopping along sideways in here. Still look like they could be in some trouble over the intermediate term. Okay. Uh, the energies and the commodity-related stocks have been working their way higher, but they're taking their own sweet time. And now it looks like the energy is trying to break out again in here. Metals and mining have been lagging a little bit. looks like they're trying to wake up a little. One thing good about commodities, at least if you're long, is a lot of times they could have nine lives, okay? They look like they're going to die, and then they come back. They look like they die, they come back. They could be really choppy, okay? Phil says, uh, so there's really no need to go through a lot of sectors. The other point I was making is a lot of times these sectors have broken out and come right back in. Now they're trying to go back up to new highs based on this recent little strength we've seen. But I wouldn't get too excited about stocks in general right now. And I would just pick your spots really carefully. Okay. Uh, Phil says TLT short, no bow tie yet, double top ish at new highs. Well, it's not at all time highs. Okay. But it is, uh, I guess it's close enough. Yeah, close enough for government work. Okay. So if you do see a uh, bow tie in bonds, it might be worth a short. You can have a lot of support down here. And also, if you're familiar with reversal gap strategy, when you have a gap down after brand new highs, you wait for a little bit of retrace and then go short. I would not short bonds for two reasons. One, a lot of support below the market. And number two, it's a very efficient market. So you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to make a whole lot of money. Uh, shorting bonds, okay, but if if it sets up, but if it's a thing to do, it's a thing to do. Sometimes these efficient markets can offer opportunities is the point I'm trying to make. In this particular case, too much support below the market, okay. MU, assume you passed on overhead supply, but semi-staff, uh, well, MU is a big, thick stock, okay, and yeah, it's got too much overhead supply. It also has this big gap way down, way up here. Of course, that's that's far enough way not to worry about it, but there's too much overhead supply. Right, you answered your own question on that one, okay? RH and Cure, please. Okay, well, not that it's ever too late to short a market, but when I short a market, I prefer to try to catch it coming off of major highs, okay? So this was kind of wide and loose when it topped out in here. But you want to focus at, on getting in a market on the short side at much higher levels than once it's already lost. It's already lost 70% of its value. Not that it can't continue to drop, but you want to focus on getting in a little bit earlier as a general statement as long as the market is up towards its old highs, okay? So the overall stock market isn't that far away from all-time highs. It's sideways, but it's not that far away from all-time highs. So you want to find stocks at higher levels. Match the pattern to the market is what you want to do as a general statement, okay? So like 2009, stock market's bottoming out. 
you want to find stocks that are also bottoming out like the overall market. You don't want to try to get into the strongest stocks because maybe those stocks may have ran their course. Cure. Yeah, uh, see, this looks like electrocardiogram longer term. It's also, look, this is one of those three times things. Uh, avoid these uh, leveraged ETFs like the plague, unless you're doing something wild and crazy and stupid like day trading. I shouldn't say stupid. I got nasty gram from somebody a while back. As I said, you crazy ass day traders, and they got all mad at me. Um, but yeah, unless you're going to day trade triple leverage, and I know I beat the dead horse in this, but at one times volatility, let's say you're using a one point stop. Well, if you're trading three times volatility, three times leverage, then you would use three times volatility, you use a three point stop. So it all washes out. So the leverage all washes out. So there's no reason to be trading these. Again, if you're day trading, but then you're you're leveraging up, and then that's a whole other story in and of itself. B I I B is a short. You gotta be really careful, obviously, with biotechs because uh they can announce drugs or whatever. This is a really thick one. Uh, unfortunately, though, it's already lost over half of its value. It still looks ugly, though, and pullbacks along the way. I hear you, and it's still at relatively high levels. But, again, you want to focus at getting in uh, when it's coming off of major, major highs as opposed to in longer-term downtrends, okay? Match the pattern to the market. Okay, Howard says, NVDA shows sleeper but persistent advance. Recently, I had recently had consolidation with fresh breakout today. Would stop a little consolidation. Well, I'm not a breakout guy, except in rare cases with IPOs. Um, one thing that jumps out at me right away here is that this thing was off to the races and then just kind of lost steam, okay? You want to see a market go up and then accelerate higher, Okay not accelerate higher and then lose momentum. So there's nothing for me here. Uh, maybe on a pullback, we'll reevaluate it. But right now, there's nothing to be trading there. CNX, CNX, we are long. Full disclosure. Um, if it breaks out to new highs and then begins to the pull back, it might be worth a shot. So it'd have to break out first and then pull back. So break out and then pull back, okay? Net, net, it's pretty sideways, but it does have a little bit of that Darvis style look to it. In other words, kind of build a box, go up, build another box, and so on and so forth. Okay, BCOV for Rick, I believe, BCOV. Uh, yeah, on a pullback though, there's nothing to do here. Uh, but see, there's your there's your acceleration of trend, kind of thin, okay? If you're a private trader, as you are, I know, uh, you could possibly go after, but it's kind of thin. Be ready for a bumpy ride. Longer term, it's got some issues. I mean, this is a long time ago. So I wouldn't go get too concerned about this, but you can't you, – you've got to put this – Weigh this as part of the evidence. If you're if you're thinking about not taking the trade, then you certainly need to put that factor in. Or if you're thinking about taking a trade, either way you want to look at it. But you do have some issues longer term here to deal with. But shorter term, yeah, I could see on the pullback it might be worth a shot. Daniel wants to know about TCK, TCK, and think you other guys should be impatient. We'll get to those. Uh, yeah, it's breaking out to do highs, but what's the rule here? We want to see a breakout and then look to play a pullback. So, yeah, absolutely. Put it on your watch list. TRN, long watch list. Uh, probably if it's making new highs. No. No, I don't see why that would be. I mean, you got some overhead supply to deal with. It's wide and loose. It's, eh. Kind of hard for me to be excited about that one. You know, maybe once it bottoms out, we'll see. But I, I'm not, I wouldn't definitely put that on the watch list. Uh, on your watch list, you want to have things that are um, – this might not be the best examples in the world. But you want to have things that are making new highs. No, wrong. Let me see if I can find them in here. You know, some of these stocks that I have on watch list, you can see are making new highs. They're going higher. I don't know why I got some of this garbage in here and needs to be cleaned out. But, again, you can kind of see some of these stocks in here 
that are on the watch list. They've bottomed out. They're making new highs. They're going higher, okay, as opposed to some of those. And, again, I've got some crap in here that needs to be cleaned out. ENBL for Angelo. ENBL. Uh, yeah, we this was on the service a while back in a Landry list, but we passed because it has overhead supply. So shorter term, it looked okay, but now it has it, – it, longer term, it's overhead supply. Also, a lot of days of the pullback, so it's too many days of the pullback now for me to consider it. Um, I mean, it looks okay as far as it's still at an uptrend. It's just pulled back a little bit longer term. But when you weigh that against the overhead supply, okay, so maybe maybe if he didn't have overhead supply, but that's – remember, we look – you know, you're in a service, Angelo. So same reasons I gave back then, same reason as I give now. You know, that's the other thing that teaching has forced me to do is be consistent, Okay. And if you give a reason, stick with it, right or wrong. You know, I worked for a hedge fund for a while, well, 14 years. I guess that's a little while. And he told me early on, he says, uh, I had a prior partner, and I'd ask him what he thought, and he would he would give me a bunch of arguments, different sides of the markets, and he would never give me a definitive answer. And he says, at least with you, Dave, you give me a defensive, definitive answer, right or wrong, <laughs> you know. Often, often wrong, but never in doubt. And that's where you have, I think that's the secret to trading, okay, is be being willing to be often wrong, but never in doubt. And know that you're going to be often wrong and have a stop to take care of that. And then the winners will take care of themselves. Uh, yeah, this has overhead supply. It's utility. Uh, but it is a uh, pretty good uh, volatility for utility. But, yeah, overhead supply to deal with. Uh, most of your move was on this gap here. Not that I wouldn't uh, totally avoid a trade, but when you have because of a gap, but this was a 70, this was a 100% gap or a 70% gap. How big is that gap? That's bigger than that because you got the high in there. Uh, you know, measure from there to there, 20 to about 80% gap plus overhead supply. So throw that one out. Toss it. GMS for Mr. Don, GMS. Uh, no. Um, this is an IPO. You know, wait, see if it can make new highs and then reevaluate it, okay? And even if it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily fit the, the breakout pattern because it started off too high. Donald says Z in a pullback. Well, probably if it's trending. Yeah, we'll know when we see it. Um, it's okay. Yeah, maybe on a pullback. I'm not as excited about the stocks that are up at all-time highs as I am some of the stocks that are making a little bit more of a transition right now. But you take what you get and you don't throw a fit. So if some of these add new highs start pulling back, then we have to reevaluate AXDX for John. John, it looks good so far. Let's see. Ooh, yeah, you got too much overhead supply to deal with. It's like the hardware store couldn't, uh, couldn't make it because it had a, a brothel overhead. It was too much effing overhead. <laughs> Ninth grade humor there. Yeah, you've just got all this trading above the market. Uh, it's just stupid. Ridiculous amount of trading. So, again, my form of technical analysis isn't really that technical. We're just reading the the mind of the market, okay, participants, and acting accordingly. In this particular case, a lot of overhead uh, resistance. So I would avoid this trade. Bill says, three sweet uptrends, RYI. Yeah. Yeah, this is a pretty amazing persistent trend that I've seen with this stock. Just absolutely, look at the persistency here. Uh, it didn't really knock out much, but this has definitely been on my watch list for a while. And look, here it is right here. It's in the call list. 
TNET and OKE. Hey, John, you're welcome. Welcome back from uh, vacation. I think you were on vacation. Oh, I'm getting you confused with somebody. Never mind. Uh, welcome back if you were on vacation. Um, I don't like this big gap down here. Markets have long memories. Uh, I know the further back it is, the less important it is. But you'd be surprised how long people will hold stocks. So I'd probably toss it out just based on that. And then OKE, another uptrend. OKE. Yeah, I got you confused with Travis. Both of you guys have been kind to me, so that's probably why. Yeah, it's a decent trend there. Um, maybe on a pullback. We'll reevaluate. We'll also see where utilities are. Then um, you do have a little bit of overhead supply to overcome. Pre pre watch list. Pre 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 watch list. <laughs> Or pre. No. CLF, that's going to be a metals and mining cliff, I believe. Um, you're going to have to wait for it to make new highs. Okay. Uh, these metals and mining, these uh, like the CNX, you know, in these longer term downtrends that made these nice little bottoms and all, and or 100 or 200 percent away from any. Uh, meaningful overhead supply or whatever might be worth a shot okay uh cliff certainly but right now it's kind of wide and loose it kind of sold off hard a little bit of a gap it came right back so let it make new highs see if it can stay there and then look to play a pullback team for gary well it's working its way higher and it has a little bit of uh of supply way back here it is still a relatively new issue so I would say see if it can keep breaking out okay like a little bit more decisively than it's already broken out maybe up towards these old highs and then look to play a pullback pre pre watch list is a joke oh, okay gotcha <laughs> that's what I figured you meant yeah a lot of times and, and that's why it's, it's good to have the, 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 the fact question in the service it's like People ask me, hey, what do you think about this stock? It's like, yeah, it's in a trend. It's in an obvious trend. You could draw a big blue arrow on the chart, but there's nothing to do with it until it pulls back. Should I put it on a watch list? Well, if you think you should, you should. And yeah, you should, okay? So absolutely. There's a random person fishing in my pond. <laughs> Team. That makes no sense. That's caught my attention. Okay, we looked at that one. Okay, uh, any more? Okay, while we're on an impasse, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. Here we go, Twitter. TWTR. Twitter. The question is, daily bow tie off an all-time low. Yeah, but what are you seeing there, Bill? What's the what's the possible problem? The possible problem is you got to come up, you got to come through this resistance. So, well, first of all, it's a big thick stock. Okay, super super. How many million is that? Zero, two, one, three million or two hundred? I forget how many. Let's see, one, two, three. One, two, three, 23 million on average daily volume. That's a lot of volume. A lot of people fighting it out. Not that I wouldn't ever trade a big, thick stock, but yeah, if it gets through this uh, overhead supply here, then maybe in a 20, 20 something dollar range on a pullback. And see, that's the hard thing too sometimes is you got you to gotta say, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to have to wait until the stock gets above 20. That's a 25% or 30% move, whatever the case may be. Yeah, so what? You know, there's there's another 2,000 stocks out there you could be trading. Don't expect every stock to set up and don't go after every stock. Just wait, okay? And sometimes that might mean waiting for it to, to get to higher levels. We're not trying to pick a bottom. GBT, garbage. My father-in-law says garbage with a W. Um... 
yeah, this is one we went after a while back, failed miserably. But it could set up again. Uh, you know, sometimes with these bow ties, you'll get like a, a second, what I call it, second, um, second mouse type of signal. It might come down here, bottom out a little bit, and then take off again. But there's no need to go after it now. What's garbage, Angelo? Mux. Okay. Um, did we talk about this one already? I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move, but this should be on your momentum list. See, I have it in here. Again, I've got to clean this thing up, but um, I'd like to see a little bit more knockout on something like this. And I'll know it when I see it, but right now, I mean, put it on your watch list for sure. AIG, read that icon bought in, big. Who's icon? Uh, well, it looks like a short to me. Uh, if I had to, I would short this because it's coming off of all time highs and it's coming into a bow tie. I'm not crazy bearish just yet. It's also look at the HV. It's really, really low. Um, AIG or AG, AJG? Well, we'll do AJG while we're here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a little too, the volatility is too low. AIG. Okay. Uh, AIG. Come on, Dave. You could do it. Yeah, I mean, it's a bow tie down, but it's not coming off all-time highs. Okay. Eh, it's not bad. But, again, you want to you know, focus on your first leg with these transitional patterns, and now it would actually have to make new lows and then pull back again. So now you go from, from trend transition to trend resumption. Let me show you what the difference is. Okay. Um, trend transition – or emerging trend is when you have a market that kind of tops out and does like this. You're looking to get in at that first little rollover or on a downside makes a little rally from low, a little bow tie or something. That's emerging trend. Trend resumption is when you have a stock that's in a longer term established trend. This I probably could have drawn this a little better. It should be, look more like that. Trend resumption is when you have a trend in a long, a stock in a longer term trend. That's pretty obvious. Draw your big arrow and then pulls back a little bit. Okay. Icon is Trump supporter, also small investor. Yeah, I know who he is. Carl Icon. Yeah, I know who he is. I'm just being stupid. Uh, you know, what difference does it make? Okay, you know, you start you start factoring stuff like that, you're just gonna mess up your life. X L T Y. I like that when it's in my watch list, uh, but it's not set up right now. X, L, T, Y. Yeah. Could you guys use caps when you're punching your symbols? I can't see them. <laughs> and then take them off before you finish your comment. Yeah, I've been watching this one. Obviously, it's in my list. Um, but I'm waiting for a pullback. It's very persistent. It looks pretty good. You know, this might be an exception of buying a stock that's in a longer-term uptrend. Now, it has had a pretty good run. Okay, so that's a little scary. But sometimes you have to do the hard thing in markets. So, yeah, make sure this on your watch list, okay? Boy, are you lucky. We have the Brexit vote and a visit from Donald on the same day. <laughs> yeah. Boy, I tell you, it's like uh, damn if you do and damn if you don't, huh? I think it's a, kind of a better the devil you know situation. <laughs> what a mess. E&BL honorable mention. Okay. Yeah, we talked about that one. Uh, is it a good setup? Yeah, it's it's it, well, it was set up recently, and I did have it in service recently. But as I said earlier, uh, Otto, you must uh, or Otis, you, you must be just joining us. Uh, I did have some overhead supply to deal with. Okay. Okay. Uh, any more? You're welcome, Angelo. We let him in. <laughs> Phil says we let him in. Four hundred thousand signed a position to ban him after. His close HTE borders to undesirables comments. Well, now you guys are trying to close your, your borders too, though, right? I mean, isn't that this whole exit thing? Keep the bad guys out? So, yeah, I try to avoid comp. <laughs> you spelled it wrong. It's Duche, D-O-U-C-H. 
EY, I guess. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, I love doing these shows, obviously. Uh, and I have a blast doing them. Okay, we'll just get a couple more in, and then we'll finish up. TDD. Um, no. Okay, because it, it, it tried to take off. It came all the way back in. Now it's just kind of messing around. DDD or SSY. Okay, I have to choose. Okay, uh, I choose neither. Uh, but if I had to choose, maybe this SSYS could bottom out longer term. It might be worth a shot. All right, one last one. Otis, your last one. EXEL. Uh <laughs> Craig's making a joke, I think. One I can't repeat. Yeah, I mean, keep this on your watch list because it's in a persistent trend. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback, kind of uh, wide and loose at all, all the place longer term. Uh, I don't like all this gap in and on. So I have to reevaluate it once it pulls back. Anyway, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time and business because you'll be here. Uh, hopefully we sell you guys and girls again next week. And, uh, well, next week's 4th of July, huh? I guess I still might do a show. Yeah, I'll still do a show. So uh, see you guys and girls again next week. Any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. If we don't talk to you now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.